England was much less populated. It was not regarded as a major power in any way, in European terms. It was a small island off the continent. Uh, population, nobody really knows, but three to five million. So a tenth of the number of today. And it was, of course, a much simpler society. Uh, it was basically a system whereby all land was held from the king in return for military service and big estates and the important people were the great barons who surrounded the king. The problem was that Edward II had a series of favourites who were extremely corrupt and who were great barons but who offended the rest of the great barons and there were a series of rebellions against the king and Isabella in the end who was a powerful character in her own right uh, fled to France with the young Edward III uh, because she simply could not get on with the king's favourites. And in 1326, uh, she came back. England had been through an enormously traumatic few years. Um, the king, Edward II, had been pretty much a disaster. Things had come to a head in 1326, 1327, when Edward's rule had been challenged by his own wife in the name of their son. She had come back to England at the head of an army with her lover Roger Mortimer at her side and she had toppled her own husband from the throne. So by 1330 there had been three years of rule that was supposed to be better than what Edward had managed but actually of course the fact that England was now being ruled by a queen mother and her lover in the name of a teenage king was deeply deeply unsettling. In 1326, she and one of the disaffected barons, Roger Mortimer, landed in England with Edward III uh, in open sort of rebellion against the king and very rapidly gathered an army. And Edward, in fact, nobody really wanted to support him. They captured his uh, chief followers and um, he was in the end captured in Wales and uh, brought back to in pr prison in Berkeley Castle. It was the first time since the conquest that a King of England had been deposed, but when you depose a king, it's always really useful to get them to abdicate as well, belt and braces. So Edward, under clear compulsion, did renounce his throne in favor of his 14-year-old son in 1327, and was then, of course, murdered for good measure as well. <laughs> belt, braces, and the kitchen sink. So this was a deeply, deeply traumatic moment. The killing of a king, uh, the deposing of a king, what was it going to mean for the monarchy? And then to have a man who wasn't an anointed king, didn't have any right to the throne at all, apparently ruling England through his illicit relationship with the widowed queen mother, deeply challenging, deeply disturbing. He was uh, behaving very much as uh, the ruler of England in terms of splendour and court festivities, which actually Edward and his friends all thoroughly enjoyed, but um, you know, they recognised underneath it that they were allowed to play, but they weren't allowed to rule. You're relying on some official papers, a lot of rumours, uh, people who claim to have seen or known people who saw what was going on and t uh, cutting through it in the end you have to say is it really probable that he escaped to live in an Italian monastery to come back to see Edward III in Cologne in the 1340s and then died in unknown circumstances after that or is it more likely that these were all rumours put about uh, by people who for one reason or another, for instance, didn't like Mortimer and wanted to raise a rebellion against him in the old king's name, and that in fact he did die in Berkeley Castle, and of course the circumstances would be mysterious because they didn't want to admit to having maltreated or even murdered the, king, the new king's father. I don't think she had any part in it. There is evidence that she was quite fond of him, but just felt he'd been wildly misled by these uh, uh, favourites. Uh, the first one famously was a man called Piers Gaveston, who was exiled and eventually executed.
But I don't think Isabella had any part in it. I think it was Roger Mortimer who was frightened of plots involving Edward II, who, you know, in Berkeley Castle, alive, uh, there could be a conspiracy to release him uh, and overthrow Mortimer, in which case Isabella would be in a tricky situation, but she wasn't going to be executed, whereas Mortimer certainly would have been. Uh, so I think it was he who, uh, if anybody, had him dispatched. I think as far as uh, Edward himself knew, he would have been told that he died of, you know, uh, despair, as Richard II did, or said to have done, uh, or of illness. I don't think at that point there was strong suspicion of murder. I think it comes up later after Roger Mortimer's out of the way. Edward was definitely underage when, they, uh, when Isabella's coup was mounted, so Isabella took over as regent. And what happened was, it was a question, always an open question, as to when Edward would take power. Uh, so he was going to eventually become king. Uh, but how the transfer of power would work was another matter. I don't think uh, anger at his father's death figures at all. Um, what is much more important is that Edward had his own friends and although Mortimer had stuffed his household with his Mortimer's supporters, um, Edward was definitely in a circle of young men of the same age or similar age to himself and Mortimer suspected them of encouraging Edward to think independently and wanted to banish them from Edward's court and that was the breaking point. Isabella and Mortimer's regency really was never going to be a long-term prospect. It was their good fortune in a way that the heir to the throne was only 14 so that they could seize that moment but he was getting older by the minute and other members of the political community who'd supported the deposition of Edward II because Edward II's rule had been so damaging for the kingdom were not really happy as it emerged that Isabella and Mortimer were also going to rule in their own interests, to enrich themselves. Mortimer was becoming ever more entitled, quite literally, uh, and ever richer, ever more controlling of the resources of a kingdom that wasn't rightfully his. Mortimer had every reason to be paranoid about plots from within. He knew that his hold on power was not really legitimate and he was wrapping his tendrils closer and closer around the young king who of course was, was, was growing to manhood and he knew that he was in danger uh, because his control couldn't really last but he was trying to cling on for as long as he possibly could. They had actually been extravagant uh, in their government and Mortimer was not uh, governing England particularly well. They were having quite serious problems. Uh, simply because of their really rather insecure position. The old king was still alive, the young king was present but a kind of puppet and uh, it was not an easy moment to take over England uh, with a lot of suspicious and uh, really sort of slightly fearful lords who weren't quite sure which way to jump and so yes it was it was ripe for overthrow. Nottingham was an incredibly important strategic centre. I think we have to slightly readjust our modern sense of geography to take account of medieval travel. To have these great royal fortresses in the heartlands of the country, in the Midlands, was so important to keeping control of the country when you think that there was no standing army, no telecommunications, no motorised transport. If you're going to make royal rule effective throughout the country, you need places like Nottingham to pin your kingdom down. I think Mortimer probably thought he was pretty safe at Nottingham in 1330. He was in this great royal castle built on this great rock and he had surrounded Edward the by now 17 year old king with Mortimer's own guards, he had his own people everywhere, he was um, taking great care about the information and the communication that was going in and out of the castle and of course he had Isabella by his side. He thought he had all angles covered. <laughs> 
He suspected the inner circle, actually, because what he tried to do was to admit Edward to the Nottingham Castle and uh, have the rest of the uh, entourage not allowed into the town. Uh, and that was what really um, gave him away, so to speak. And that is the point at which Edward's closest friend, William Montague, uh, said uh, the famous line, uh, better to eat the dog than be eaten by the dog. And uh, they went ahead with the uh, uh, plot for the coup. And that was achieved by, in fact, getting entrance to Nottingham Castle by a secret passage. In fact, it seems that Montague had checked out the constable and had uh, made sure that he wouldn't resist. And what they did was quite clever. They went in by a postern gate now that's a sort of gate which is rarely used uh, and is usually a kind of private exit to the castle. The position of such gates wasn't always known about but somebody told the conspirators where it was and they got in that way where the guard wouldn't challenge them. And so they were able to gain access to the castle and find Mortimer uh, without a guard and seize him. Edward probably wasn't actually with the conspirators. Uh, if he was, he wasn't present when Mortimer was seized. I think it's probably unlikely that the young king was there at the very moment when swords were drawn and Mortimer was taken into custody. Uh, the art of kingship, and it would later turn out that Edward III was a master at the art of kingship, but the art of kingship is partly knowing when to be there, when to exert your direct authority and when you need to stand back. This was a moment to stand back, but we can be certain that the young King Edward was integrally involved in this moment that was all about taking the power that should rightfully be his. There are varying accounts, but I think they almost certainly reported back to him. He may well have been outside the castle and come in. I think what happened probably was they went in and he was only to come in if the plot was successful, because otherwise they'd have been exposing him as well as the rest of the plotters. In fact, it's barely even a military operation. Uh, in fact, it might be quite nice to say it's not a military operation. It's actually uh, a very personal intervention and in a way shows sort of Edward's courage, personal courage uh, and his decisiveness. Because, you know, he had, he had to give the go-ahead Montague could suggest it, but Edward had to say that, yes, we'll do it. Uh, and he didn't have to go in with sword in hand himself. That would have been foolish, uh, because he might have been overpowered, and that would have been the end of the plot. It was a personal intervention with swords uh, and with great strategic planning. The hidden secret of Nottingham Castle was a path carved into the rock on which the castle was built, through which it was possible to enter the castle without being seen, without being heard, but get right to the heart of the royal apartments, the centre of royal power. And that was what Edward and his companion dis discovered. And so this small band of young knights were able to get into the castle before anyone knew what was happening and get Isabella and Mortimer in person, get control of them personally, and in a world where politics is intensely personal, power is intensely personal, if you've got Mortimer, that's it, the regime's over. Uh, what Isabella actually cried out, fair sirs, I beg you not to hurt him. He is a worthy knight, a well-beloved friend and dear cousin. And that was addressed to the knights, not to the king. Uh, and that is pretty reliable evidence because the account that it comes from was probably written um, by somebody who talked to Montague. The relationship between Isabella and Mortimer had clearly been a very intense one, a very powerful one. It seems that she tried to save their position together to save him. There was no chance that she could. Her son was determined that his rule should be just that, it should be his rule. And that meant that toppling Mortimer also meant toppling his mother. Mortimer was taken for trial and uh, condemned by his peers and executed, executed within uh, a month or so of his seizure. Mortimer's fate was a very unpleasant one. You wouldn't wish on anyone. He was executed as a traitor. Uh, this great earl who had commanded all of England, 
was hanged at Tyburn like a common criminal. Isabella was uh, retired, if you like, to Castle Rising in Norfolk, where she at first was kept under fairly close guard, but eventually was uh, just allowed to live out the life of a really a queen mother, so to speak. But she didn't often come to court. Isabella's fate was a very honourable one, but it was divested of all the power that she'd exercised for the last three years. She went into retirement for a few years away from the court, um, clearly very comfortable retirement but also equally clearly compulsory uh, and eventually she was brought back a bit more closely into the life of the royal family but only at a stage when it was absolutely clear that her son and her daughter-in-law were calling the shots, they were the king and queen. She lived out her life in great luxury uh, but never again was she going to get her hands on the reins of power. If Mortimer had continued to rule, there was even a rumour that Isabella was pregnant by Mortimer. And if that had happened, uh, all, all sorts of scandals would have uh, erupted. Obviously she wasn't, because nothing happened. <laughs> it's impossible to recover the private story of Isabella and Mortimer's relationship, but it was so clearly close, it was so clearly by the standards of the day inappropriate that stories were always likely to fly around. It's not impossible that there was a pregnancy. It was clearly a passionately attached relationship. We just can't know. Um, we can't say whether, whether she was ever pregnant or not. In one sense, it might be unlikely because she was a very canny woman and it wouldn't have been a good idea. Um, on the other hand, it was extraordinary that she was able to do what she did to topple her husband as the Queen of England with her lover at her side and yet Edward II's failings were so great that whatever she and Morton were up to for a brief moment mattered much less. It began to matter much more in the next three years and that those chickens came home to roost in 1330. If the plot hadn't succeeded and it had been open warfare at a later date it would have been much more serious. He was extremely good on the military side and he was an innovator, he was uh, a quick thinker uh, and uh, he was a very good manager of men, which none of his predecessors had managed. There was no problem from any of the magnates, the great lords, throughout his reign uh, until the very end uh, and that is exceptional among medieval kings. He actually managed to get the uh, rulers, uh, the, the, the powers that be in England, united behind him. And in a way this is uh, an example of him being the centre of a group of people and that same group goes on. Uh, I think half the conspirators reappear at Cressy and, and at Poitiers and some of them are in the original order of the Garter. And one of the interesting things about Montague is that it's the first example of Edward uh, or Edward being involved in something which is a very uh, sudden action. And in two or three critical periods of his reign, he does something personally, which is a very swift reaction to events, which is very unlike other medieval kings. And I think Mont Montague taught him that and it's a lesson he, uh, that stuck with him because, for instance, in 1350 uh, there was a danger that Calais, which he just won, would be betrayed to the French. He got wind of it and instead of passing the message on, he went there personally immediately after Christmas with just 24 knights, a very small number of people, secretly and swiftly. Again, uh, he turned up at a critical moment in 1340 when there was a threat he was in Flanders and there was a threat of rebellion by the people he'd left behind and uh, he landed at the tower at midnight, found that the keeper of the tower was away, summoned the mayor of London and told him to arrest five uh, major lords uh, on his word. The mayor had no authority to do it but did so uh, and uh, you know, he, it was sudden action. He turned, nobody expected him nobody knew where he was and he just suddenly turned up at the tower in the middle of the night. It's a wonderfully dramatic moment. So this is a part of a series of events which are similarly dramatic. Isabella was an absolutely extraordinary woman. 
uh, she had a very developed sense of her own importance, and quite rightly so. She was the only daughter of the great King of France, Philip IV. She expected that her role as a Queen of England would entail helping her husband to rule. The fact that her husband turned out to be not only a disastrous ruler, but someone who was in the end prepared to sideline her, pushed her into decisive action. Um, it lasted for three years, and she lived out her life after that far away from the levers of power, but we should remember that it's through her that Edward III acquired his claim to the throne of France and began the Hundred Years' War.